We'll pick up reading from our Gospel reading from John chapter 6 and verse 60. Jesus has been explaining to the disciples and all who would listen that He and He alone is the only way to eternal life. When many of His disciples heard it, they said, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? But Jesus, knowing in Himself that His disciples were grumbling about this, said to them, do you take offense at this? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where He was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who those were who did not believe and who it was who would betray Him. And He said, This is why I told you that no one can come to Me unless it is granted him by the Father. After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. So Jesus said to the twelve, Do you want to go away as well? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. This is the Word of the Lord. Have you ever struggled with a particular Bible passage? I don't mean necessarily struggled to understand it. I mean those ones that are clear, they're pretty simple, there's no complicated words, no deep theological thought here. Your real struggle is whether to A, to believe it, Or B, to live it, to obey it, to submit to it. You know what it is. You know what God is asking. You're just not sure you want to do it. You don't want to give it up. You don't want to take it on. You don't want to change your life in that way. You don't want to assume that responsibility. Or you don't want to give it up to God. Sometimes the Word of God is hard. It's difficult. It's a struggle for us to believe. And that's what Jesus is addressing here in the second half of our lesson. People used to believe in this country that the Bible was the Word of God and that it would guide and direct not only our life, but the life of our nation and our culture, our society. But that is a foregone day. Just three years ago, the Gallup poll people did a poll, and we discovered now that only 24% of all Americans, 24%, just a tad below one out of four, 24% believe that the Bible is the Word of God, it should be taken literally, and it is the norm, the source, the inspiration for our faith and our life. About one out of every four. 26%, just the other side of one out of four, 26% believe the Bible is made up of myths and stories and lies. And while it is a good book to read and it's good to know about what the Bible says, it has no real relevance for our life or our daily context. 47% believe that God inspired some men and some women and they wrote down their thoughts, but it's their thoughts. And their thoughts do not always speak to our day, our time, our context. And so you have to discern yourself Which part of the Bible you think applies to you today and which parts don't? You can just ignore them. You can just move on. They're not really speaking to you or your day or time. And if you've been doing the math with me, we're at 97%, which tells us that 3% had no clue what they believed at all. But we are living in a day and a time and a culture where we don't accept the Bible to be God's Word and to be the norm for our faith and our life. That makes it not only hard for them to believe and for them to accept, it makes it hard and difficult for us to witness and to do ministry. Take, for example, those of you who are members here, if you remember last year we did a vision workshop and as part of that workshop we talked about some survey work that had been done by people who live within five miles of our congregation. So if we're the epicenter and you move in any direction five miles, 
there's over a hundred thousand people who live in that circle. Those people were asked to react to a statement. Jesus Christ is the only way of salvation. Jesus Christ is the only way of salvation. Within five miles of our congregation, only 32% of the population agreed with that statement. Just a tad below one out of three, meaning two out of three don't agree, don't believe that. They're not saying that Jesus isn't a way to salvation. They're not saying that Jesus might not be your way to heaven, but he's not the only way. There have to be multiple ways. There have to be multiple roads, many options. You see, because it's hard and it's difficult, it's a struggle to say Jesus is the only way, because if he's the only way, what do you do with all those people you know who don't believe that? What about those people you go and you work with them day after day after day, but you know that they don't believe in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior? If he's the only way, they're left out. What does that mean? They're lost. What does that mean? They'll go to hell. What about all those kids that you walk up and down the hallways at school and you laugh and you joke and you share memories and you're creating a wonderful social life together, but they don't know Jesus, they don't believe in Jesus, they don't trust in Jesus. If that statement is true, that he's the only way to eternal life, then that means they're not going to eternal life. What about the people across the street? What about members of your family? Friends you've known for decades. And all of a sudden the Word of God is very hard and very difficult. Because if you're going to believe it, if you're going to trust it, if you're going to accept it, then it is motivating you and it is challenging you to get out there and witness and share your faith. And a great many of us are uncomfortable with that and don't want to do that and aren't going to do that. So it's just easier to say, well, that's just not true. Or maybe it's true for you, but it's not true for everybody. So let's just ignore the word, deny the word, manipulate the word, twist the word around until it gets me back into my comfort zone and then all is good. In the text, the word of God is hard, it is offensive, it is also, of course, the only way to life. They listened to Jesus and he said, I'm the only way. If you don't bring me into yourself, if you don't eat my flesh, if you don't drink my blood, if you don't believe in me, if I'm not part of your faith structure, you have no eternal life. No one comes to the Father but through me. There is no other name under heaven by which man can be saved, save the name of Jesus. The biblical testimony goes on and on and on. Jesus is God's answer to our sin, but he's his only answer to our sin. And the reaction of all these people who have been following Jesus is this is a hard saying. Now what made it hard for them wasn't so much the exclusivity of Jesus. What was hard for them is that meant that they played no role in it. They had grown up in their Jewish faith, taught by their rabbis and by the Pharisees that you had to be good. You had to obey the rules. You better do what God tells you to do because that's essential for your salvation. If you're good, you're saved. If you're not, you're not. It's up to you. Do the right thing. And all of a sudden, Jesus is saying, what you do is meaningless. It's what I do that matters. You believe in me. And everything that they knew and everything they believed and all the lessons from Sunday school just got erased. And they said, whoa, this is a hard saying. Now, the Greek word there for hard means it's inflexible. We'd like the Bible to be a little bit more flexible, wouldn't we? You should give 10% of your income to God, unless, of course, you have student loans. 
or you drive a nice expensive car or live in a wonderful home or need to take this incredible vacation or just maxed out your credit cards in which case then you're exempt from that we just need a little flexibility God come on just a little You shouldn't lust after women in your heart. That's wrong. <laughs> I, I'm trying, Lord, but have you seen that woman? G give me a little break here. I mean, look. We need God to, you know, meet, meet me somewhere here, God. And he says, no. There's no flex room here. There's no gray area. There's my will and there's not my will. And that's it. As one preacher once said, it's like banging your head against the wall. If I ask you to all get up, now you're not going to do that, of course, but if I ask you to get over here and bang your head against that wall, well, after a while, something's going to happen. Your head's going to hurt. But that wall isn't going to move. That wall is not going to flex. It's not going to say, oh, well, this is hurting you. L let me soften up a little bit for you. It's not going to do that. It's not going to change its nature at all. You're going to get hurt. And this is part of the difficulty of this text because, you see, Jesus is saying, if you listen to me, if you obey me, if you accept my word, there may be some pain in your life. And I'm not going to change that. And I'm not going to make it easier for you. I'm not going to flex at all. I said stay faithful to your spouse. Period. I said take my name in vain. Never. I said, you will not steal. Pay taxes to whom taxes are due. Don't cheat. No matter what, no matter why. The Bible confronts us and it makes us uncomfortable. It exposes the brokenness and the sinfulness in our life. And that can be painful for us. Sometimes it shows the shallowness of our faith or the weakness of our obedience. And that shames us. But it won't flex. It won't meet us halfway. God said, this is the word. Listen. And obey. Jesus then went on to ask them a question. Uh, Does this offend you, he said? Does this bother you? Now, we translate that word into English as, does this offend you? Uh, the Greek word is scandalizo, from which we get the English word scandal, or to scandalize. But literally in Greek, it refers to a stumbling stone. Ever been walking down a path or walking through a field and you're walking through some tall grass and maybe you're having this wonderful conversation with people around you or you're just enraptured by the beauty of all the nature around you. You don't recognize that little stone in the field and boom, your toe hits it. How many of us love to stub our toe? And you're doing the, you know, that dance. You know? Or you don't see it, and I'm not going to do this, but boom, over you go. And sometimes that's the Word of God. We translate that offensive, but really, uh, ha have you fallen down? Did the Word of God trip you up? You were just going along your merry way, and all of a sudden God said, you shouldn't be doing that. Now what? Moan and groan and grumble and complain. Say a few <laughs> words that you really shouldn't be saying. Get mad at God because he put that in your way. Or do you get back up and repent? I should have never been on that path, God. I should have never been going in that direction. I was wrong. 
Thank you for tripping me up. Thank you for knocking me down. I will now turn and go the other way. If I am the only way, if there is no other answer, does that offend you, Jesus said? And a great many people said, yes, it does. See you. And they left him. I want some part in this. I, I want some recognition that I'm good. I want some recognition for all the sacrifices I've made. I need you to realize how hard it's been for me to live the kind of life I've lived, but I did that for you. And now you're saying that's meaningless? Now you're saying it's not enough? Now you're saying I'm lost and only you can save me? <laughs> uh, no. And they didn't. And they left. So where is it for you? Where has God drawn a line and when you walked right up to it and it wouldn't move and it wouldn't flex and it wouldn't change, did you turn and walk away from Him? You know what He wants. You just don't want to do it. You know what He would have you do. You just don't want to do it. You see, the world wants a Jesus that is accepting and tolerant. I don't want to change. I want Jesus to accept my life, my lifestyle, my behavior. I don't want to change. I want Jesus to tolerate. I want him to tolerate all the things I do and the ways I act and what I do, what I don't do. You know, if, it, if, it, if it's upsetting, if it bothers you, Jesus, well, you know, just, just be a little tolerant. But he's not. An accepting Jesus and a tolerant Jesus doesn't need to go to a cross. But a God who says there is a right and a wrong and you're wrong sends his son to a cross to take all those wrongs upon himself and wash them away in his blood. Our society wants an accepting Jesus, a tolerant Jesus. They don't want a forgiving Jesus because if He's a forgiving Jesus, it means they did something wrong. And if they did something wrong, they shouldn't do it again. They should give it up. They don't want to. How about you? So they leave. And so Jesus then says, well, okay, uh, guys, 12, are, are, are you going to leave too? Peter, who is always so impulsive, who always has to answer questions, who always needs to speak for everybody else, every once in a while he gets it right. Lord, to whom shall we go? They're all going to run back to their synagogues and they're going to run back to their rabbis and they're going to run back to their sins and they're going to run back to being lost. There's no answers there. There's no hope there. There's no life there. You have the words of eternal life. Interestingly enough, the word that is here in Greek is zoe, not suke. Enough said? No, you don't know those. Suke is your soul. But zoe is both soul and body. Peter understood something wonderful here. There were a lot of people in his day and time who wanted eternal life, who sought eternal life. They tried to be good so they could earn eternal life, but they thought of eternal life as only a spiritual existence, 
your body would be left behind because your body was contaminated with sin and it was wrong and it was rotten and it was bad. So you wouldn't have a body in eternal life. You just have a soul. No, Peter said, you have words of body and soul. I'm going to eat ice cream in heaven. Can I get an amen? Bible, one of its most common analogies for eternal life is a banquet. Amen? Just saying. I'm going to have a body. And it's going to run and it's going to do all these incredible things it used to do when it was much younger. And I had opportunity to minister to a girl who got polio at 16 who couldn't walk, couldn't move her arms, couldn't breathe on her own. She needed a machine to breathe for her. She went to college that way. She got a master's degree that way. What do you think it meant to her to talk about an eternal life? God's going to give you a new healthy body and you can run again. What does it mean to the blind and the deaf and the lame that God will give you a new glorified perfect body in eternal life? What does it mean to those who struggle at the end of life with diseases like cancer or Parkinson's or other terrible debilitating diseases that there is a promise in the resurrection of the body and there is life everlasting. There is nowhere else to go. Jesus, you and only you can bring us such life. Purchased and won by your death and resurrection. So they stayed and they believed. They believed when it was hard and they believed when it was offensive and they are an eternal life. When it's hard and when it's offensive, what will you do? Where will you go? Or better yet, where else can you go? When I got into ministry 40 years ago, people used to come to my office and they would say, Pastor, I'm really struggling. I don't know what God wants. I don't think that's the struggle today. I think we know what God wants. We just don't want it. But Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise that the Word of God became flesh and dwelt among us. He was full of grace. He was full of truth. The Word of God become flesh, went to a cross, gathered up all our sins and washed them away. He didn't excuse them. He didn't accept them. He didn't tolerate them. He forgave them. He took them away. And He reconciled us with you. We thank you, we praise you, we worship you, we love you, for you have saved us through your Son. Keep us in that one true faith until we reach that life everlasting. We pray, Lord, for the people of Haiti, who once again have experienced a devastating earthquake and the loss of hundreds of lives. Comfort them. Strengthen them. Take care of them. Move, inspire, and motivate the hearts of billions of people around the world to see our brothers and sisters in need and to reach out and do what we can to help them. In this time of crisis, be their rock, their refuge, their strength. Lord, we have our own issues here at home as we continue to see this pandemic spike here and there. Wrestling with vaccines and masks. Possible lockdowns again. Be our rock, be our refuge, be our source of strength and peace. You and you alone are the great physician of soul and body. 
Yes, you chasten, but yet you heal. Grant us your healing grace and rescue us from this time of danger and fear. Grant your healing grace to Clay Arnold, the stepfather of Jen Brown, and to Bill Hoppy, who's recovering from a stroke. Heal them. Make them whole, healthy, strong once again. We give you thanks and praise that in the waters of holy baptism, Patty has received the grace, the truth, and the beauty of Jesus. The Spirit of God has entered into her heart, for she is now the temple of God. You have washed away her sin. You've reconciled with her. She is your daughter for eternity. Be with her, watch over her, bless her, and strengthen her every moment of her life that she may remain strong in her faith and confident in your promises. We pray for discernment, Lord, as we continue to seek your will for our ministry here. Guide and direct us by your Holy Spirit. Open our hearts and our eyes that we might see and know, and then give us the faith and courage to follow. We all have our own needs and wants and desires. We have our own struggles and fears. We ask you, Holy Spirit, to intercede on our behalf and to raise these before our Father in heaven. Hear our prayers and grant us all good things. We ask this in the saving name of Jesus. Amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen.